All right. Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. For everyone joining us online or at our Discovery Northwest campus, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. Come on, guys. Are y'all ready to hear the word today, receive the word today? Hearts open and receptive. Before I jump in, let me ask, can I ask for your prayers? This week, me and a couple pastors, Pastor Brennan, Pastor Sean, we're going to Uganda this week. Um, We got 500 pastors from all over Africa coming to just get training and equipping and leadership and outpouring. Uh, We have just an opportunity that was opened up to us to bless this nation. And so, Pray for us as we're going and imparting. I pray for that. That's what the Lord put on my heart, an impartation by the laying on of hands in Africa to these uh, pastors in uh, in Africa and in Uganda. How many going to agree with me in prayer with that? Amen. I need your prayers. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're in this series, Dream to Destiny, and we are studying the life of Joseph. In the life of Joseph, we can see various tests of his, of his life, of his character, of his faith. And, and every test that Joseph came up against and passed, we see his life going from like glory to glory. We see like an elevation of how God used him and even the gifts that were operating in his life. And I believe that we as well face various tests through our life. And here's what I hope as we study the tests, 10 of them in all, the tests that Joseph had to take uh, that, that you'll see, you'll be able to see the tests as they come at you differently. Because I think that we're being tested throughout our life when we go through challenges and circumstances and crisis and relationships and difficulties. And, and some of you just don't know what that is. It's actually the opportunity that God has given you to elevate your faith, the opportunity to develop your character, to, to strengthen your faith, because what he has called you to is greater than than who you are right now. And he's got to do a work in you before he does the work through you. So we've done two, two different tests we've seen in Joseph's life. Uh, the, the, it started with the pride test. And we see like when you get a dream, and the beginning of a dream often generates more enthusiasm than wisdom. And so Joseph is excited about the dream, but puts his foot in his mouth and starts boasting about it. He fails that pride test, okay? Then that ends him up in last week, we talked about the pit test that ends them, ends them up in a pit. Here's what you need to know if you're in a pit today, you guys. You are not defined by your pit. You are prepared by your pit, okay? That pit that you're in or that you got yourself in, that mess up, whether it was by, because something you did, someone else did, whatever, go watch last week. You need to take responsibility. Amen, somebody, okay? So you're not defined by that. You're prepared by that. Joseph gets out of that pit. Here's what happens. We're not going to read it, but let me recap you because where we're going today. Reuben, remember, wants to restore him to the father. He wants to kind of rescue him from that pit. But Reuben goes and gets some water from a well, and he leaves his brothers there with Joseph. And his brothers see these Midianite merchants coming, and they go, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into this slave trade, you know, auction thing going on. And these Midianite merchants, they they sold Joseph to these Midianites. The Midianites take him to Egypt and auction him. Off. And that's where we're going to begin today with the palace test. The palace test. Yes, they all begin with P. That's how you know it's from God. Amen, somebody? Okay. Amen. <laughs> so here we go. Genesis chapter 39. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Genesis chapter 39. We're going to read the first six verses of chapter 39 together. Look what it says. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from those Ishmaelites, those Midianite merchants who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, key, and he prospered. Somebody say prosper. Okay, that's what the Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When the master saw that something was different inside of this young man, he saw something that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success. Somebody say success. Okay. God was with him, caused him to prosper, caused him to have success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his whole household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned, 
From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. I want you to see this, that Joseph had so much favor of God on his life that it spilled over into people that didn't even know God, didn't, didn't serve him, or actually serving a different God and worshiping different gods and idols. That's what his favor brought, blessing to his house. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he didn't even have to concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Joseph took care of it all, okay? Now we see, this is a pattern we're going to see from this point on in Joseph's story, that Joseph had the presence of God in his life. He had the favor of God. And because of that, the people around him brought him close. We see it in the prison. We're going to talk about this next week, but let me show you in Genesis chapter 39, the same Verse 23, the same kind of incident happened. It says, the keeper of the prison didn't look to anything that was under Joseph's authority because, look at this, the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So everywhere Joseph goes, we see that people see him, and they say, man, he's got the favor of God on his life. He's, he's got the presence of God on his life. He's successful in whatever he does, and they bring him close. Very different Joseph on this side of the pit then on the other side of the pit, you see, self-promotion is never a substitute for divine promotion. Joseph, every time he tried to promote himself, it, it worked against him. He, he, he gets a dream from God, goes to his brothers, and he's like, man, I'm gifted, I'm talented. God's given me ability. Can't you see this ability in me? You guys are supposed to bow down. It didn't work. Every time you try to promote yourself, it works against you. But here Joseph is, and all he is doing is trying to please God, and God promotes him. Self-promotion is never a substitute and can never substitute divine promotion. So I got a very simple question for you today. Would it be okay if God promoted you? Would it be okay if the Lord caused you to prosper? Would it be okay if the Lord made you successful in all that you do? Would that be okay if the Lord prospered you in your health, in your finances, or in your marriage, or in your business? Would that be okay? Okay, I'm going to show you today what changed inside of Joseph. There are four keys to success today I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you four keys, simple keys to being successful or being prosperous, to being promoted. And I'm going to reverse engineer this. There are certain keys that build on top of each other. And I'm going to show you how, biblically speaking here, that you can be prosperous or you can be successful. Is that okay with you guys? Can I teach you through the Word of God how you can do this? Amen? Okay. So let me show you. I'm going to reverse engineer it, though. They're going to build on each other, just so you know where we're going, okay? Here's the first key. Write it down like this. The key to prospering. We see in the story, in Joseph's life, and all throughout the Bible, the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. That's important to see in this story, that the Lord was with him, so he prospered. Now, let me just time out right here, because I think I need to address and, and call out something that some of you may be even thinking here, that, that, that that word prosperity is not a bad word, okay? And I know so we, there's this false teaching out, that, out there of a hyper-prosperity teaching. It's called the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel or the name it and claim it or the word of faith movement. This, this hyper-teaching, I'm aware of it, I don't believe in it. This hyper-prosperity this hyper teaching says it is your right to have health and wealth because you're a child of God. By faith, you can have it if you believe it and you declare it. Yeah, okay, okay. So, so I, I'm, I, that is not the, that's not true. That's not true. That statement in and of itself is not true. Here's what I think, though, because we have seen so many false teachers so many false preachers of the gospel promoting this narrative of the word that is just not biblical. And some of us, because of that, have actually pulled away from a biblical understanding of the word entirely. Like entirely. We just, we don't even want to deal with prosperity or we don't even want to deal with success because we've seen a negative side of it. In fact, I appreciate, I kind of appreciate the word prosper more than success. It's, you know they're different, right? Let me show you scripture. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. God tells Joshua, 
Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written on it. Here's the promise. Then you will be prosperous and successful. There's a difference. So with God, here's the difference. With God, you can be prosperous and successful. Without God, you can only be successful. We see this in the case of the rich young ruler in the Gospels in the New Testament who was very successful, had a lot of wealth, but something was missing in his life. He comes to Jesus and says, I've done it all. What else do I need to do? And Jesus tells him, go and sell everything you have. Come follow me. But yet he was so rich, he wouldn't want to surrender. He walked, can I tell you, he walked away rich, but not prosperous. Okay, there is a difference between having the prosperity of God, the God prospering you and you just being rich. Can I in the Hebrew, when you see that word, it's used 63 times, by the way, in the Old Testament, that word prosper. You know what it means? All it means is this. You don't need to be afraid of it. God uses it quite often. What it means is to push forward. That's what it means. Okay, look, God wants to push you forward in your life. He wants to push you forward in the storm instead of getting stuck in the storm. He wants to push you forward in your marriage. He knows you ain't the man God has called you to be, and he's going to push you a little bit to get you to move forward. God wants to push you forward. Are y'all okay with that? Okay, so this is the, that word where it means to prosper. Let's look at it in Genesis chapter 26, an example of what God says about this word. Then Isaac sowed in the land, and this, so this is like, I believe, the grandpa of Joseph. So he sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now watch and see if God shies away from using that word prosperity just because there's false teachers and he's hypersensitive about it. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. That looks pretty biblical to me. I don't know about you. So that's like, okay, he wants to prosper you. Now listen, he wants to prosper you so you can prosper others. He wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. Let me show it to you in the New Testament. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. He says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. What does that mean? That you may be pushed forward in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God just pushing you forward. See, the key to prospering is the presence of God. You know why? Because God has never failed. He has never failed. So if we walk with the presence of God, then we will prosper through. We will be pushed and propelled through. The problem is people go out from the presence of God. It's not that God removes his presence from you. We remove ourselves from the presence of God. When you walk with God, you are successful. When you don't walk with God, you are not successful. And I'm going to use those words interchangeably, successful and prosperous. They're very close, but the key to success, the, the key to prospering is the presence of God. I, I want you to know that God would like to push you forward. He would. God would like to push you forward in your life. God would like to push you forward in your business. He would like to push you forward in your marriage. He would like to, to for everything that you put your hand to, he would like it to be pushed forward. And the key is God's presence in your life. Even an unbeliever, Potiphar, recognizes that the Lord was with Joseph and his house. Potiphar's house was blessed because the Lord was with him. Here's a good question. Does your employer, whether they're a believer or not, does he or she believe that they are more blessed because you're working for them? If the answer is no, listen, and you lack success in any area of your life, maybe in your career, your education, your relationships, your finances, it's very possible you need the presence of the Lord in your life and not just on Sundays. The key to prospering is that I'm, I'm trying to reverse engineer this for you. Joseph learned something through his failures of pride and ended up in a pit. He came out different. He wasn't trying to promote himself. He wasn't trying to get to a place or a pinnacle anymore. He was focused on the presence of God, pleasing God. Okay, the, the key to prospering is the presence of God. I talked to so many people who, who once had the presence of God in their life, and you may be here today and you used to be on fire. You used to sense God. He used to give you a word or a scripture or you'd feel his presence. And, and, and maybe lately you just haven't. I talk to people all the time that don't know where it went wrong. 
What are wrong? I call it a spiritual rut. It's not like a pit, you know, not a pit, but just a dry place. Everybody gets to this, these dry places. First of all, we shouldn't go off our feelings. You need to live by faith first. But there is a reality of these dry places that we can get into. And so before I give you the rest of the keys that build on each other, I need to, can I just kind of teach this for a moment? Because it's so important for you to have the presence of God in your life. And when you're not walking in the presence of God, you can sense it. What happened? Let me give you really quickly three gauges for you to check. When you feel like, Man, where did the presence of God go? I can't hear him like I used to. I don't feel propelled by him like, like I used to. There's three gauges that you need to be checking for your spiritual vitality, okay? Three questions. Let me give it to you. Number one is this. Ask yourself, how am I spending my time? How am I spending my time? Let me say it like this. Is God first in your life? Is he first in your day? Is he first in your relationships? Is he first in your family or your business or your finances? Because if he's not first, one of the biggest causes of you getting into that place of spiritual drought is this word neglect. Some of us neglect the very foundational principles that got us here where we're not reading the word of God like we used to. We're not spending time with God in prayer and in worship outside of an experience that somebody else does for me. I'm not seeking God like I used to. We neglect the foundational habits. And then we wonder how we drifted. How come I can't hear God and sense God? This neglect creates a pattern of us misprioritizing our life. A lack of prior, the right priorities in our life. And it's not that God leaves you. See, what happens is neglect muddies the connection. It just, you know, it's like your, your, your phones. How I many love 5G? Praise the Lord for 5G, right? You got all kinds of windows open and stuff. I'm like, it, when, you, when I have 5G, it's going, it's going. And I like, I love speed, okay? Speed is amazing to me, okay? But, but uh, that didn't sound good, but, but you know what I meant by that. I love fast internet. That's what I <laughs> love fast internet. But what happens is when, when, it, when it gets to like 4G or 3G, oh my gosh. I, 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 it gets me, it, you know, the flesh comes out of me. You know what I mean? I'm like wanting to rush this thing. And, and, or now they have like a plus sign. Y'all see that plus sign that, on your phone? That is not plus nothing. That's plus baloney is what that is, plus so it doesn't mean that you lost connection, right? When it goes down to 3G or 4G or now this plus thing, it doesn't mean you lost connection. It just means that, that it, the connection isn't as strong. It, it's muddied. So God didn't leave you. You, you, you still save. That's just because you're neglected. It doesn't mean you lost your salvation, but you can lose your intimacy. You can lose the level of closeness and proximity. It's just not as strong. Every time you feel far away from God, please listen to me. God didn't move, you did. So we ask ourselves these questions because the key to prospering is the presence of God. And when I'm lacking the presence of God in my life, I have to, how am I spending my time? Here's the second gauge. I'm just trying to give you some gauges real quick as I build on top of this. Actually, let me give you this verse, Matthew 6, before I give you the second gauge. But seek first, not, not on the list, but on the top of the list, okay? Here's, here's, Here's where neglect comes in. He's got to be first on the list. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Second gauge now. Second gauge is this. Ask yourself, am I staying close to Jesus? Am I staying close to Jesus? That's a great question to ask yourself when you feel dry or in a spiritual rut because a lot of times our relationship and our, our closeness to Jesus is hindered by sin. The sin in our life, this something in our life that gets in the way of our closeness. And, and I don't mean to like, like make anyone feel, and I use that word not as a judgmental word. This word is a reality. We all, we all sense it. We all deal with it. But there's two types of sin, you know. Let me, let me show you this because this is very important for you to realize when it comes to your spiritual vitality, the presence of God in your life. There are two types of sin, the sin of omission and the sin of commission. The sin of omission is where it's the things that we should do, but we're not doing. The sins of commission are the things we shouldn't be doing, but we are doing. Do you see the difference, you guys? In either case, whether by omission or commission, this, this sin 
will keep us from our closeness with God. Ephesians chapter 4, 27 says, do not give the devil a what? Not a wide open door. Not a, not a open, no, no, no. All he needs is a little crack, you guys. That's it. Just, just room where you gave him access, where you gave him legal access into your life to be a lion to devour. Well, I'm going to talk more about this in our next series on spiritual warfare coming up in August, you guys, okay? But, but this is something you got to ask yourself. When you're, when you're feeling like the presence of God, when you're not discerning or hearing, well, am I staying close to Jesus? The third gauge is this. Ask yourself, am I growing? Okay, the key to the presence, the key to prospering is the presence of God. And when we've lost it, what's going on in our life? Am I growing spiritually? Am I moving? Am I making progress? Am I taking next steps? Am I stewarding the influence God has given me? See, God desires for our relationship with him to always be moving, never to stay still. See, when you, when you stop, we experience this word, stagnation. You ever see a body of water that is stagnant and the nasty stuff that rises to the top? Just the, the gross film and stuff. When you're stagnant, here's, you're still reading the Bible. You're still coming to church. You're still worshiping. You're still, you're still doing those things, but you're lacking the, the power. It's like nothing's changing. What I have found when people become stagnant in their faith, it's because of that reason, because they may be doing things, but nothing's changing. Nothing, nothing is changing in their life. There's no movement. There's no excitement and joy and, and passion when God has called us to ever increase from glory to glory. When was the last time that you were, you were reading the word of God and were convicted and said, oh God, forgive me? Or when was the last time you heard a word and you said, my goodness, that's for me. I need to be. Here's, I, love, I love this example of the Israelites when, when God was taking them from Egypt and from slavery and giving them the promised land. The, God actually, with wisdom, and it's a, it, it is a parallel to our life, with wisdom, he actually enters them into the promised land, but he doesn't give, it, give them the entire land. Look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, 22. Let me explain it. The Lord your God, he says, will drive out those nations before you, all these nations that were living in the promised land. Look what it says, though. Little by little, you will not be allowed to elim eliminate them all at once, or the wild animals will multiply around you. In God's wisdom, he knew that they could not handle the full measure of the destiny God has called them to, that he needed to little by little prepare them. This is exactly what he does with Joseph. It's what he does in our life. Little by little, he will drive things out of your life and prepare you to inhabit the entirety of your destiny. So let me ask you, when was the last time God showed you the next little bit? When was the next, when was the last time God showed you, here's the next little, here's the next part of the land, here's it. Are we, are, we, are we still growing? This is a question we need to ask ourselves because God wants to build you up. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to mature you. He wants to refine you. Colossians chapter 2 in the Living Bible, I love how it says it. It says, and now, just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust him too for each of your day's problems. Like continue trusting him. Live in vital union with him. And then he says this, let your roots grow down into him. Some of you have been moving around and jumping around from church to church, and you ain't got no roots. Jumping around from this preacher to this preacher, this pastor to this pastor, this house to this house, and you ain't got no roots, man. Let your words, roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. See that you go on growing in the Lord. That's God's will for you, for you to go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Okay, I just... I. Sometimes you get there. I get it. We get dry. We get in ruts. The presence of God is so vital and important for your life. It is. The key to prospering is the presence of God. Now, some of you are thinking, well, pastor, I want to walk with God. I want to hear him. I want to experience him. What's the key to that? I'm going to give it to you. They're going to build on each other. So what is the key to the presence? Here it is. Number two, the key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. It's obedience. Now, it's so important that you don't confuse this fact with 
the, the reality that we are saved by grace. Now look, if your salvation is based on your works, if my salvation is based on my works, I'm in trouble, okay? Because I don't work well all the time, okay? We don't work well. We just don't. It's, a, it's not. It's not based on works. It's based, we are saved by grace. Grace is a gift of God that cannot be earned. God loves you. He has a gift for you. It is eternal life in Christ. I believe in grace, but I also believe in obedience. And if you want to achieve your destiny and pass the palace test, you need to learn this principle that the key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. You see it all throughout the scriptures. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 18 of King David, it says this, David behaved wisely in all his ways. And because of that, look what it says. The Lord was with him because he, he obeyed God. Now in verse 12, it says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. So why was the Lord with David? Because David obeyed. It doesn't mean he was perfect, by the way, because there were times where he wasn't. But then when he was confronted on it, what he did was repent and come back to God. But why did, why did King Saul, why did the Lord leave King Saul? Because Saul disobeyed. And when he was confronted with his imperfections, he did not repent. Deuteronomy chapter 11 says this, see, God speaking here, I am setting before you today blessings and a curse. This is God giving us a choice here, you guys. God says, see, I'm setting before you today. There's blessings and there's curses. The blessing, if you obey the Lord, the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. The curse, if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God. Now, listen to me carefully. This isn't a work, works-based doctrine. This is not what I'm teaching here. It's not what this scripture is saying. We are saved by grace through faith, we go to heaven by grace. But hear me, please, if you want to succeed in the destiny God has for you on this earth, you're going to have to learn how to obey the Lord. If you obey and walk with God, you will walk in success. It doesn't mean everything's going to go well all the time. It doesn't mean you're never going to have problems or trials or difficulties or storms. It just means that when storms come, God pushes you through them. That's what that means. God will, you won't get stuck in the storm. He will push you through the trial, through the test, through the storm, through the tragedy. Let me read you another scripture, Job 36 and 11. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. I have seen that when I, you guys, when I walk with God in obedience, I am blessed Everything I put my hand to is blessed when I walk with God in obedience. When you walk away from God, though, you are cursed. Now, listen, God doesn't curse you. No, 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 no. Don't get that. God does not curse you. We live in a cursed world. It's like God has this amazing, strong umbrella. And out in this cursed world is a hailstorm of trials and tragedy and difficulty. And we, when we are walking with God, we are underneath the, the covering of God, under his shelter and blessed and protected and covered. But when we choose to walk away from God, we're choosing to get out from under his covering and try to, we're trying to dodge the hailstorm all by ourselves. I like what it says next. Look what it says. But if they do not listen... They will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. And it's like they don't know why. Why is this happening to me? Why does why this always happen to me? Could it be that you actually made the wrong choice? Why does why this happen to me? Could it, could it be that you got out from under the covering of God? You tried to do it your way instead of God's way? Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Now, here's what some of you are thinking. Well, if I'm, hon if I'm honest, it's real tough for me, Pastor. I, I have a hard time, you know, obeying all the time. I just, I, you know, that's just, it, it's hard. So how do I, how do I do this, man? I'm going to need the key to obedience. I got you covered. I told you they build on each other, okay? Number three, the key to obedience is faith. Yeah. Do you, you know why the farmer plants? Because he believes there's going to be a reward. That's why. Many of us have more faith in the water heater than we do God. Because, you know, you turn, you, what do you do when you turn on the hot water and you touch it? 
It's cold. You just wait. Because you know, you know, you trust, you believe, you turn that faucet to hot, it may start out cold, but it's going to get hot, and I'll wait for it. Listen to me, if you turn on the faucet of obedience, it may start out cold, but it's going to get hot. And if you got to believe that, you have to believe that. But here's the problem. We don't believe that there are rewards when we obey and consequences when we disobey, if we believe that, we would obey. But if we're honest, let's be honest here. Many times, we feel like we can disobey and get away with it. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. That's the whole reason why you're still secretly addicted to pornography. Let's be honest. It's the whole reason why you're not telling your, your, your spouse about what you're doing with the money. The whole reason why you flirt when you're, oh, oh, it's, the, it's the whole reason why you disobey is because you think that you can get away with it. Listen, you don't get away with it. You're just undermining your destiny and prolonging your purpose. It may look like you're, no, 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 you're not getting away with it. I promise you, you're going to circle that drain. You're going to, if the test will come around, the test will come around, the test will come back around. What God is trying to do is, is build up your character and your faith to actually hold the destiny. You're undermining and prolonging it. The reason children obey is because they believe they'll be rewarded if they do and punished if they don't. That there's consequences for disobedience. Now, not today's culture, my bad. Today's culture, you would you know, you're at restaurants and, and the way they're acting up or in, or in like the shopping, like Target or Walmart or something, they're like pulling stuff off. The way that they talk to their parents, my goodness. Ephesians chapter 6, people, tells us that the fifth commandment of God comes with a promise, right? Obey your mother and your father for it may go well with you and you will live a long life. That is, that is a promise. If children believe that if they obeyed, it would go well, and they disobeyed, there would be consequences. And the Proverbs, by the way, Proverbs says those consequences are spankings, by the way. If they believe that, they would obey. I had to teach my kids this. I spanked my kids. Now, not out of, you can't say that nowadays. I don't care, okay? I, I didn't do it out of anger. I didn't do it because I liked it. I did it to save their soul from hell. And that's what the Bible actually says, you guys. I had to teach my kids this. I remember my kids, they'd be, you know, one time my kid was like, like getting into something they weren't supposed to get into. And I'm like, you stop. Hey, if you don't stop, I'm going to spank your butt. And I ain't going to tell you which one it was because all of them have a different story. <laughs> all of them did the same thing. You got to spank it out of all of them, okay? But they're like this. I'm like, and they look at me like, before it could get to their mouth, yaga, right on the back of their butt. And the Lord gave them padding right there so that they can, <laughs> right there. Where am I at? But. I don't only believe in consequences, right? I believe in rewards too. So, so like we, we reward good behavior. If they get good grades, if they share, if, they, if they're a good worker, they, they get good rewards. Look, if you knew and believe that if you worked hard for your employer, even though he's an unbeliever, that God would reward you, you'd be a better worker. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people who think, you know what, when I get a better job, I'll, be a, I'll work harder. When I get a better boss, then I'll work harder. You're not going to get a better job because you're failing the palace test. Why would God give you more when you ain't handling what you got? Why would God give you more when you ain't being faithful with what you have now? This is the palace test. And I'm just trying to help you out here. If you want this blessing, this favor that's on Joseph's life, if you want to be successful and the Lord to prosper or to push you through, then you got to pass this test, you guys. The, the key here to obedience is faith. Let me show it to you. Hebrews chapter 3. It's not trying harder. It's not doing more. It's believing. Believing is the key. Look what it says. And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if, now this is the reward of the promise, who would not receive the reward of the promise if uh, not those who disobeyed. So we see that they were not able to enter 
because of their what? Where did that word come from? He was talking about obeying. You would think, he said, well, they disobeyed and they weren't able to enter because of their, dis, their, their disobedience. But he didn't. He said of their unbelief. You know why? Faith produces obedience. If you believed it, you would do it. If you believed it, you trust God with it. Okay, the reason why you're not obeying is because you don't really believe that there are consequences when you don't. This is, this is the reality. This is the key here to obedience is faith. Faith produces obedience. Let me, let, me, let me give you one more. Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from trying harder. No. Nope. The obedience that comes from faith. He's talking about Gentiles who did not have the law, who did not have the prophets, who didn't have the Ten Commandments. What they have is obedience that actually comes from faith. The key to prospering is the presence of God. Because if you're walking with God, He always succeeds. The key to the presence of, of the Lord is obedience. The key to obedience is faith. So now we need to think, okay, then what's the key to faith? Now, this is the one that's the most practical of them all. It's so simple. Every one of us can do this first step that will propel you into the presence of God. It will propel you towards prosperity. You will choose whether you're going to prosper or not. I won't choose it for you. Your parents can't choose it for you. It's not about your boss. It's not about your past. You and you alone will choose. If, you will, if, if God will push you through, cause you to be successful in all that you put your hand to, you get to choose that. Nobody else. And it starts right here. I'm telling you, this is like, this is how it starts and how it has to start. It propels the rest of it. Number four, the key to faith then according to the word of God, is hearing the word of God. That's the key. Some people say, well, no, the key of faith is doing. No, I already talked about that. According to the scriptures, the key to faith is hearing. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You say, well, is it really that simple? Yes. You want to increase your faith? Get more of the word of God in your life. Listen to the word. Come to church. Listen back over it. Listen to other great preachers. Like, let's study the word of God. Know the word of God. Hear the word of God. If you want to prosper and God to push you through, if you want to succeed, this is where it starts. That this word will be hidden in your heart. And as you hide this in your heart and you study it, I'm telling you, your faith would increase. And your faith increase will cause you to actually believe what God says when he says it. It'll cause you to say yes to God. Yes, yeah, oh, you, yes, God, I'll obey, I'll obey, because I know your word. And that obedience, I'm telling you, will cause the presence of the God to manifest in your life. And it's that presence of God that will make you prosper. It'll make you successful. He will push you through. I want you to think about these last three points. I talked to you about prospering, in the presence of the Lord, obeying, having faith for believing, hearing the word. So check it out. Here it is. Hear, believe, obey. Hear, believe, obey will bring the presence of the Lord in your, in your life and will make you successful and prosperous. Don't just settle for success. You can have this world's success, but God wants to prosper you. God wants to push you through in your life to new levels to get you to your destiny. I want this for you so bad. I, I, want your, I want your life to prosper even as your soul prospers. I want your families to prosper. I want your marriage to prosper. I want your businesses, your finances, and your, I, I, I want it to, I'm not saying it's always going to go well for you. This isn't a prosperity gospel. I'm not, I, I, but I, I want you to, to see the progression of how God can work in your life and push you through, man. Like, you don't need to carry it on yourself. You don't need to figure it out. You don't need to work it out. What you need is the presence of God. This is what Joseph learns, and we see from this point on, this is the lesson he learned from his pride in his pit. That it's not about how gifted I am. It's not about how loved I am. It's not about what I have and what other people don't. The opportunities that I have. No. 
it's actually about the presence of God. It's about Him. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.